love T.D. Jakes, the big bishop of the Catholic Church. Don't we just love his preaching, especially when he gets his Catholic slant on the Sabbath? Let's have a listen. Now, the same thing has happened with the New Covenant of Jeremiah 31, 31 that Christianity is so familiar with. Behold, the days come, saith Yahuwah, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It is not a new covenant that replaces the everlasting covenant. It merely replaces all the previous covenant renewals that restore the everlasting covenant in the past. Since it involves not an earthly king such as David or Josiah, as we saw earlier, but it is Yahuwah's very own son, the Messiah. This is the preeminent renewal. Yahushua is our Messiah who restores the everlasting covenant between us and Yahuwah. And it involves his own very own blood and life. Now we see where Hebrews earlier was referring to. In Jeremiah 31, 31, it continues to verse 32. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith Yahuwah. You see, it's a marriage covenant. Christianity is so full of divorce right now. This is a manifestation of the true spiritual state of Christianity. It is the mother of harlots, the Catholic Church, that is her head, not Yahuwah. So, divorce rates are skyrocketing in their churches, their organization called Church, the Circus of Chaos. But Yahuwah has his bride ready. Those who are determined not to be spiritual adulterers, to be loyal to the covenant as Yahuwah is loyal in the covenant. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith Yahuwah, I will put my law in their inward parts. This is the ultimate goal. This is the end times. This is what the whole purpose is. He is making the law the focus, the whole purpose of all this, not doing away with it. And he will write it in their hearts and will be their Elohim and they shall be my people, he says. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying no Yahuwah. For they shall all know me. Who is they? Is it Christianity who is committing spiritual adultery? No. It is those who are married and loyal to the everlasting covenant. Who keep his Torah. Not those who say it's done away with. And who are doing their own thing. Like T.D. Jakes. And he says, and I will remember their sin no more because they're not sinning anymore in the future. Thus saith Yahuwah, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon, and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the ways thereof roar. Yahuwah of hosts is his name. Now, he says, watch very carefully. I'm tying this in now to the Sabbath. If those ordinances depart from me of the earth, the sun, the light, the day, etc., the stars, the sea, the waves, if they stop working, in other words, then he says, the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Now it is obvious that he is making it very clear that until the earth is replaced with a new earth and a new Shamayim, pagan word heaven. Until that time, his covenant does not change. His everlasting covenant remains. So later on, we're going to see that T.D. Jakes tries to make out 
that we are now living in the age of grace, right? As though there is a different age before the end of this earth. No, that's not what Yahuwah says. He says, there's no new covenant, covenant of grace. There's the everlasting covenant, which has been renewed, and which has his law, his Torah, including the Shabbat, Sabbath keeping, on the hearts of the people, and in their minds, Ezekiel prophesied, For thus saith the Master Yahuwah, Elohim, I will even deal with thee as thou hast done, which has despised the oath in breaking the covenant. Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with thee in the days of thy youth, and I will establish unto thee an everlasting covenant. Will not be quick to assume he is referring to a future everlasting covenant, since it says, An everlasting covenant I will establish. However, the word an is misleading. The Hebrew word here for establish is actually kum, which can also mean to strengthen. So the current understanding is that he will strengthen the everlasting covenant which is already in place that is confirmed as well when he says and they will remember their ways and be ashamed you can only remember and be judged for your past sins in light of the Torah while it is present you cannot be judged if there is or was no Torah previously so this is the everlasting covenant to which he is referring which has been eternally present, past and future, as the Hebrew word olam explains. So the new covenant merely strengthens the already existent everlasting covenant. Regardless of what was broken by the people previously. Regardless of whether Christianity wants to break his covenant. His everlasting covenant is established right now by Yahushua and in us who keep his everlasting covenants. That means we keep Shabbat. Shaul too has emphasized that Yahuwah's everlasting covenant of the law is established, carried out, not done away with by his renewed covenant through so-called faith or grace now, to establish does not just mean some academic exercise. It means to continue in it, to covenant. The very word means to covenant with your word and continue in it to hold it up. Hold up his Torah and stand by it. We remember the people stood in the covenant when Josiah restored it. So, Greater moral conviction and greater gratitude to love and obey Yahuwah establishes the law. We perform the law as did Josiah when it was renewed. Here it says that he might perform the words of the law. He got rid of all the familiar spirits, wizards, images, idols, you know, the things that are in your Christian church. He got rid of them. And he performed the words of the law, which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the master Yahuwah. And like unto him was there no king before him that turned to the master Yahuwah with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses. Neither after him rose there any like him. So by the example of Yahuwah's begotten son now, who was a Messiah king, and is from Shemaim and not the earth, he exceeded that of Josiah in obeying his father's Torah, 
right to his very death, and in so doing, he promised and confirmed eternal life for us. We must walk as he walked. We guard our own hearts out of love and emunah, personal moral conviction, once we are truly servants of Yahuwah and obey his commands out of love. For this is the love of Yahuwah, that ye keep his commandments. That is love. So, if you do not keep the Shabbat, you do not love. Simple as that. It's a circular argument that Christians try to use. Oh, it's all about love. Undefined love, worldly love, not Yahuwah's love, which is commands. We saw how Nehemiah needed the gates guarded by the Levites earlier to stop the people entering in on the Sabbath. But now, as we head into this new moral conviction which is written upon our hearts and in our minds, and we have this gratitude which has grown, we no longer need Levites or schoolmasters at the gates of our hearts. We will want to love and obey Yahuwah. We will want to learn and keep his commands, which includes the Sabbath as clearly set out in the book of Nehemiah. And we'll do it simply out of gratitude for Yahuwah's kindness towards us and through his Son. It is quite interesting that in the New Jerusalem, prepared in Shamaim, there will be gates that cannot be shut because we will all be obeying the Sabbath. And there will be no need to shut lawless traders out or to shut people like T.D. Jakes out on the Sabbath day as they will not be in Shamayim they will be destroyed and forgotten and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day for there shall be no night there Now understand this, I want to give you just a little bit of Bible class. I don't want to get real heavy, but I want to give you a little bit of Bible class so you can appreciate where I'm going. Most of the artifacts that we are taught about in the Old Testament are shadows and types. They are teaching tools, according to the book of Galatians, the law was a schoolmaster to lead us into grace. To recap then, the law mentioned by Shaul here in Galatians is specifically the law of flesh, circumcision, and not Torah as a whole. It has nothing to do with Shabbat. Secondly, Galatians does not mention grace here. In fact, grace does not appear once in the whole epistle of Galatians. It is the Old Testament that teaches us what God has in mind. What the Old Testament teaches, the New Testament reveals. The Old Testament is the shadow of which the New Testament is the reality. In the Old Testament, God starts teaching us rest by showing us a day, a day, an eon, which is an age, which is a period. God wants us to understand that there is a period and a time where a man is to enter into rest. You will minimize the plan of God if you diminish this period down to a 24-hour period. In the shadow, it may be a 24-hour period, but in the reality, it is the day of grace in which we live right now. Are you following me? What is the reality, Mr. Jakes? The so-called Old Testament, which we have shown, is better described as the everlasting covenant. Well, this speaks of the reality, which is beyond Jakes' so-called day of grace, in which he believes he is now living. The everlasting covenant speaks of the reality of eternal life in Shemayim. It speaks of the reality beyond this shadow we are still living in on this earth which evidently is passing by. It is going to be destroyed. Colossians says the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, not were, are. Did you get that? 
they are a shadow present tense of things still to come. But the body is of Mashiach. Sadly, Mr. Jakes, this present day is not the reality. Yehoshua has not consummated the covenant, only confirmed it. The wedding feast only takes place in the millennium in Shemaim. Verily, I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the rule and reign of Elohim. How about this one? He shall send Mashiach Yehoshua, which before was preached unto you, whom Shamaim must receive until the times of restitution of all things. And Elohim shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Has that happened? No. We are still living in the present day shadow. T.D. Jakes is very, very short-sighted to the promise of the new Shamayim and new earth, which is still to come for those that keep his commandments, including the Shabbat. And even when the shadow has passed away, the reality is that there is a future repeating Sabbath day, not an eternal Sabbath age or eon, as he puts it. Isaiah 66.23 refers to the Shabbat in Shamayim. For as the new Shamayim and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith Yahuwah, so shall your seed and your name remain, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Shabbat to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith Yahuwah. Notice, one Shabbat to another. It cannot be successive Shabbats if it is one eternal Shabbat, Mr. Jakes. But in the reality, it is the day of grace in which we live right now. Are you following me? This age of grace is a weak invention and cannot replace the reality of the true Sabbath day which remains for the people of Yahuwah as prophesied by Apostle Shaw. So then, there remains a Sabbath keeping for the people of Yahuwah. You will minimize the plan of God if you diminish this period down to a 24-hour period. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of Yahuwah, your Elohim, which I command you. Is it a coincidence that Mr. Jakes would use the word diminish here when it comes to the commands of Yahuwah? We see the same words in Yahuwah's commandment. Jakes is clearly challenging the Almighty himself. 
Yahuwah commands us not to diminish the Shabbat by taking away words from it or adding words to it. While well, Jakes does not only add words, he takes away the whole Shabbat itself and replaces it with the so-called law of eternal rest under the added title Age of Grace. You do not diminish Yahuwah's commands by keeping them as commanded by him. But you most certainly do diminish them by not keeping them as commanded by him and keeping it the way somebody else tells you to by somebody else's added word. Sound familiar? Satan added one itsy bitsy little word to thou shalt surely die. Yes, the word not in the Garden of Eden. He also came with a lie that promised something greater if one diminished the command of Yahuwah. He said, Your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. In other words, there would supposedly be a reward for breaking Yahuwah's command. In this case, Jakes is offering you so-called eternal peace and rest here on earth now for you if you simply break Yahuwah's command of the Shabbat. And in return, you will simply lose eternal life in Shamaim. Was not our Savior tempted with the things of this world here and now if he would only break his Father's commands and bow down and serve Satan? Is this some new trick? No, T.D. Jakes is simply serving Satan. Now what caused God the Father in creation to bring us into rest is that he had finished from his labor. He finished from his labor and he announced that he was finished by entering into his rest. What God the Father did in the Old Testament at the end of the creation by entering into the rest, God the Son did in redemption when he had ceased from his labor of redemption and he hung his head in the locks of his shoulders on Calvary's cross and the Son Sun refused to shine and the ground began to tremble and the veil in the temple was rent from the top to the bottom and Luke says that while he was dying he uttered a word tell till let's die it is finished when Jesus said it is finished it echoed all the way back to the Old Testament when the father had finished his creation Wow, so Yahushua and the Almighty have finished all the work and she just lays around and we should just sit around all week resting in spiritual imperfection. Now, this is called the great falling away, people. This is called apostasy. This is Satan's dream, not the reality. What sayeth the scriptures, Mr. Jakes? Mashiach, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, so that we may present every man perfect in Mashiach Yahushua, for which I also labor, striving according to the working of him who works in me in power. After the finished work of Yahushua's redemption, we have Shaul here speaking of the ongoing work unto perfection. It is a continuous work of the Spirit of the Father and Son and by the believer. And when he had finished his redemptive process, the Bible said that your Lord and my God sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. The Bible said that your Lord and my God sat down. The Bible said that your Lord and my God, that your Lord and my God, that your Lord and my God. Wow, now we really see the good little Catholic Jake's is as he teaches their Jesus is God heresy. The scriptures most certainly teach 
the Son of Elohim sat down on the right hand of his Father. But they do not teach he is Elohim himself. Joshua never claimed such a thing and cannot sit on the right hand of himself. How ridiculous. And while on the topic of finished work, we know that when Yahushua the Son really does finish his work in the future, he then hands everything over to his Father and is subject to him. There is no Son equals Father, people. But each in his own order, Mashiach the first fruit, and afterward, they who are Mashiachs at his coming. That is speaking of the resurrection of us who have believed. Nobody has been resurrected. Nobody is in Shamayim right now. That is what I'm saying. And that is what scripture is clearly saying. Except Yehoshua, the first fruit. He is the only one who has gone up to Shamayim. When the resurrection occurs, then only is the end. When he delivers the rule and reign to who? Elohim. Even the Father. Not himself. He doesn't equal the Father. When he makes to cease all rule and all authority and power. For it is right for him, Yahushua, to reign until he has put all the enemies under his feet. The last enemy made to cease is death. You see, death has not been made to cease yet. Nobody is in Shamayim yet. For he, that is, Yahuwah Elohim, put all things under Yahushua's feet. But when he says that all things have been put under Yahushua's feet, it is plain that it excludes him. In other words, Yahuwah Elohim is not under Yahushua's feet. Because he has put all things under Yahushua. But when all things are subjected to Elohim, then the Son himself also will be subject to him who has subjected all things to him, so that Elohim may be all things in all. In other words, Echad, the one true living Elohim. Now, it is important for Jakes to slip this pagan Jesus in, making him his Lord and God. This is necessary, since the real spirit behind this is the evil Martian spirit that teaches that a so-called good God came to overthrow a so-called wicked God to do away with his so-called wicked Torah including the Shabbat. Of course, this so-called good God is really Satan. And entered into his rest. This is the rest that the Lord wants the church to come into. Not a 24-hour period, not the memory of a day. Well, apparently, who wants believers to not remember the Shabbat? Is Mr. Jags not being a little disingenuous now? What day does this Catholic groveling servant want you to still remember? Well, the favorite day of the Pope, of course. Let's take a closer look at his online banner. Sunday is my favorite time of the week. Not only is it Sunday, but he worships Sunday. You will find that the keeping of a day of rest is a covenant between God and the nation of Israel. But the book of Hebrews says that God has provided some better thing for us. 
what exactly is this better thing being referred to here? Is it something that replaces the Shabbat by excluding the context of this verse? Mr. Jakes rarely abuses the scriptures now. This chapter 11 honors believers who in the face of suffering, persecution, and even death looked forward to a better resurrection that will lead to eternal life in a better country called the New Jerusalem in Shamaim. So let's look at these better things. The scripture describes what moral conviction is. It is not faith. Moral conviction or steadfastness is to obey in the face of better unseen things that have been promised by Yahuwah. Now moral steadfastness is the substance of things expected, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Why? Because they were steadfast. They didn't move away from obeying Yahuwah's commands and say, Oh, let's do it this way. By moral steadfastness we understand that the ages were framed by a word of Elohim so that the things being seen not to have come into being out of the things that appear. Notice now the age is framed by Elohim's word, his Torah. We are still living in that age of the Torah. Oh, make no mistake about it. Yahushua has said it very clearly. He tells you not to think you are in another age where you can break Yahuwah's Shabbat. Do not think that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, till Shamaim and the earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle shall in any way pass from the law until all is fulfilled. Well, not all has been fulfilled. Has the earth passed away? No. So are we still in the age of keeping Torah, Mr. Jakes? Yes. Therefore, says Yahushua, Whoever shall break one of these least commandments, including the Shabbat, Mr. Jakes, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the rule and reign of Shamaim. Why? Because he won't be there. He'll be destroyed. But on the contrary, whoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the rule and reign of Shamaim. For I say to you, that unless your righteousness shall exceed that of the Pharisees and the scribes, you shall in no case enter into the rule and reign of Shamaim. Now Hebrews 11 begins with example of moral steadfastness in this current age of Torah obedience. By moral steadfastness, Abel offered to Elohim a more excellent offering than Cain. Why? because it was what Yahuwah commanded, and thus obtained witness that he was righteous. By moral steadfastness, Enoch was translated because he pleased Elohim. But without moral steadfastness, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to Elohim must believe that he is is what Elohim, not Jesus, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He is the Father, not the Son. And again, by moral steadfastness, Noah prepared an ark, became heir of righteousness, which is according to moral steadfastness. By moral steadfastness, Abraham obeyed. Abraham was not even a Jew or a Yehudi, yet he 
was a gentile, gentilis, a pagan. You were made a covenant with a pagan, with a gentile, not with a Jew. His Torah is for all people. That is what was promised to Abraham. For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is Elohim, not an earthly one, one in Shamaim people, this is the better thing. Sarah had strength to conceive, because she judged Yahuwah, who had promised to be morally steadfast towards her. So in return, she was morally steadfast. Now these all died by way of moral steadfastness, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. And they were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Why? Because they were looking for a better country in Shamayim. A better thing. For they who say such things declare plainly that they seek a fatherland. Now stretching out to that better fatherland, one in Shamayim. Therefore, Elohim is not ashamed to be called their Elohim, for he has prepared a city for them. My moral steadfastness, Abraham too, offered up Isaac, because he believed in the resurrection by Yahuwah, the promise of a better thing, eternal life in Shammai. He passed the test of obedience. By my steadfastness, Joseph too looked forward to the resurrection, a better thing, giving commandment concerning his bones. By moral steadfastness, Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of Elohim, rather than enjoying the pleasures of transgressions for a time on this earth. He esteemed the reproach of Mashiach greater reward than the treasures in Egypt. For why? He was looking to the reward, the better thing. By moral steadfastness, he also saw the unseen Elohim and kept the Passover and sprinkling of blood, seeing that which speaks of the better thing, life over death. Through moral steadfastness, they passed through the Red Sea. The walls of Jericho fell down. The hall of Rahab received the spies with Shalom. Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, through moral steadfastness, subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, and stopped the mouths of lions. Quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of wickedness we remained strong, became valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the heathen. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better thing, a better resurrection. Others had cruel knockings and scourgings, yes, more of bonds and imprisonments, stoned, sword in two, tempted, slain with sword, wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And so we see there is neither Greek nor Jew. 
a morally steadfast man that must endure, just as they did. We must now take up our persecution stake and follow Yahushua. We must obey Yahuwah's commands. And as we look forward to the better thing, the better resurrection unto life eternal, we are one and the same. We are together with those in the past made perfect to obtain that better thing that promise which we have not yet received. And these all having obtained a good report through moral steadfastness did not receive the promise. For Elohim had provided some better thing for them. No, for them and us. All of us who endure with moral steadfastness and obedience to Yahuwah's Torah, that they should not be made perfect without us. None of us has yet received that promise unto eternal life, since none of us has been resurrected yet. That will occur at the first resurrection of the righteous, and then we shall receive that better thing. This verse has nothing absolutely to do with replacing the Shabbat. On the contrary, it is telling us to be steadfast to Yahuwah's commandments.